Jonathan. Here we are uh, once again diving into uh, the hot topic that is the public cloud. And last time we were talking about refactoring legacy applications. Uh, this time we are going to be exploring the topic of serverless technology a bit more. And once again, we're here with Des uh, Holmes. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, I'm good. How's yourself? Yeah, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. It's the middle of the week. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. So that's fine. Uh, so um, a bit of a recap first. Uh, we were chatting about you know refactoring and how it works and how businesses should sort of examine their strategy around that within the public cloud. So I guess uh, first off we can we can start by examining what are the best steps for firms, say hedge funds and financial services to prepare for that? Yeah, of course. I mean, we did, we just done this last time briefly, but I think it's important for the, for the funds to, you know, evaluate the business value of refactoring as well, to make sure they fully understand that. And that involves things like um, understanding the effort to refactor the applications, not just cost, mm -hmm. but man hours um, that go into that as well. And understand um, how the application could be broken out into smaller components um, and easily separated into external services. Um, right. And also, um, as part of that, defining comparable metrics. So if you've got things like cost and performance, comparing your legacy state compared to your new state um, is a good way of understanding what the business value is. Um, and there's probably two more things to consider. One, which is understanding the target services and architecture to make you sure you're targeting the right solutions there. And as we mentioned last time, is to iteratively refactor. So avoiding big bangs. And I said, if you can break the components out um, and utilize external services, then it's it's certainly worth considering. Yes, yes, yeah, cool. That's, I totally get that. Um, so when we, Talk about uh, migrating legacy applications. That obviously, obviously, I mean, usually it involves a lot of, you know, associated data security, uh, networking configuration, you know, and there's also the this sort of very strong, powerful, you know, underlying uh, infrastructure, and this, of course, serverless technology we're talking about right now. So, can we sort of explore these uh, serverless? you know, services technology uh, uh, just in, in, in a bit more detail. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, service computing allows companies to purchase uh, sort of cloud services on a pay-as-you-go model, which is different to the sort of CapEx private cloud model. Um, yeah. So with serverless, you know, there's no servers uh, that you have to maintain. There's no VMs to manage as well. This is all handled and offset with the, with the public cloud providers, which is great. There's plenty of services to talk about. I think um, they all offer, you know, excellent scale and cost reduction opportunities compared to the legacy sort of VM or server approach. Um, a few that are worth mentioning, things like um, AWS Lambda or Azure Functions, um, these scale right down to zero or, or right up as and when you need them. And they, these are great for short running tasks, anything around automation, small ETL jobs, um, and even used now for, um, you know, the back end of API endpoints as well. So they're, they're sort of excellent. AWS, um, and again, Azure Batch, mm -hmm. um, for you know scheduled tasks a lot of clients are using these for etl processes and again these allow you to focus on the code rather than the patching in the servers and probably one more that comes to mind is the you know there's your app service so this is an excellent solution for hosting front and back ends for web application they and they also handle things like the authentication between the different services which you know is, is great because it's just one less problem to worry about yeah, yeah. It all sounds like there's basically a, a flow to it, right? They are all kind of interconnected in their roles as a, and they, they sort of uh, uh, help smoothen the process, if you will, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, expanding uh, on the serverless approach uh, and, of course, uh, tying into what you were saying previously, it is possible to sort of replace components of an application when you're doing, you know, uh, with, with these uh, serverless uh, versions of them, you know, one at a time. And this means that simultane simultaneously users utilize a kind of hybrid version of the application, right? Mm -hmm. So can we, 
can we, I guess, look into the the biggest advantages of this uh, methodology? Yeah, I think I think it's a good point. I mean, we mentioned it um, at the top of the call. There, it's just uh, getting getting the benefits sooner. I think so. If you're able to break out your legacy applications into smaller components and get those to use the native services um, in an iterative process, the, the kind of benefits that you're going to get is obviously the obvious one is cost. So rather than needing mm -hmm long running uh, VMs, you've got ephemeral services, um, disposable services uh, as, as and when you need them. So if you're not paying for them, you know, get, get, they get turned off. Also in terms of an effort reduction and sort of incident management and stress level as well, you get less maintenance overheads because um, you know, you've got the benefits of the public cloud providers looking after all the infrastructure um, and the ability, yeah. the ability to scale as well. So. You know, as well as going down to zero, which is great, right? Which you, again, you can't do with a private cloud because you've got the capex model. This is an opex model where, you know, you can, you know, you talk about the top end of the mm -hmm. scale, which is mind blowing in in some cases, but also at the lower end of the scale, you just turn them off altogether. Um, and I think one important thing to mention as well, if you pick the services off and refactor your application in smaller parts, you also reduce the learning curve as well, because there is a bit of fatigue there when it comes to learning the services. You've got to get them up to speed, you've got to bed them in, and you need to get used to them as an organization as well. It's not going to happen overnight. So again, if you can break those components out, utilize the cloud services iteratively, then um, you're going to you know, create less headaches and, and um, it's going to be easier to onboard for sure. Right, so what you're saying is, it is a bit of a challenge at first, but once you're set up, you know, you're good to go, you're fired up. That's the benefit of basically the uh, sort of generalizing a bit here, but that's the main, main crux of it all. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds pretty good. Uh, so what I'm interested now specifically is how in our previous chat, how does Docker tie into it all and what are the main benefits there? So we're yeah. talking about code right now. Yeah, I mean, as you know, Hensu, we prefer that everything's powered by code. So that whether that's infrastructure, um, yeah. using like Terraform and Ansible, um, a natural extension to this and using the serverless technologies um, is something like Docker. Um, so if, if you know companies haven't used Docker before, it is is a real game changer. Provides a mutable infrastructure. And the, the brilliant thing around here, around this concept is it's, it brings you the ability to reliably execute code in a repeatable way across any environment. So whether that's local development in a cloud service, you know, cloud, a private cloud environment on a mobile device, it's literally, you know, it's write it once, run it anywhere. Um, and it's, as I said, it's immutable. So you can push that through your various environments and it will behave in the same way. Um, so it, it reduces a lot of the overhead which you have with legacy applications and the legacy sort of release process of bundling code up and deploying it to an environment. Things around like the dependency management, which are always problematic, making sure your environments are in sync in terms of what's installed, uh, the various versions and everything. And it uh, really allows for a sort of rapid bootstrapping of environments because within sort of a single command locally, you could have an entire application um, stack stood up using something like, you know, Docker Compose. So it's really powerful and honestly a hand on heart um, we've not really turned back or would consider any other way um, other than going with a Dockerized approach for any application development. Once you've used it, there really is no turning back. Yeah, and then, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong here. So it is another component in our own workflow that has sort of all added more to the automation, right? Yeah. In a, in a way, yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, yeah it's, huge. it's huge. Cool. That sounds cool. So. What we're talking about here is uh, basically also an effort to replace monolithic, uh, you know, API approach and, uh, you know, with these really sort of flexible, uh, more powerful uh, cloud environments. And there has been some research, you know, indicating that uh, global cloud microservices uh, will experience growth, you know, for the next, I don't know, five or six years in the US market alone. Can we talk about some, some of these things? Yeah, I think there's, again, there's some really good services provided by the likes of um, Amazon and AWS, um, specifically around um, API gateways and management. So the, the good thing here is, rather than having a monolithic API, which is written in one technology, one language and deployed, you know, um, 
often in a very complicated way in order to provide scale. The AWS um, API Gateway and Azure API Management allow you to mix and match legacy APIs and new APIs behind a consistent sort of single layer API. So it could look very modern um, from the front, but actually what's going on behind the scenes is you could have um, lots of, like I said, lots of different technologies that service very specific parts of an application. And again, the, the, one of the great benefits of using the utilizing these tools is this allows you to iteratively refactor your application. So if you've got a monolithic API layer and you want to start breaking out elements of that to use a cloud native services, things like um, you know Azure Functions or uh, AWS Lambda to power parts of your API, it's very easy to stand the API layer up using these services and you know piecemeal just replace the services that are actually going on in the background. So they're they're very, very powerful and and at low scale, even at high scale, very cost effective too. Great. So it sounds like there's a lot of benefits actually there. Yeah, huge. It's a game yeah. changer. Yeah, cool. So we're I guess uh, we can wrap this one up with just sort of looking at our own I guess internal processes a bit more because we really have had a lot of experience in this. So, um, how has the public cloud actually helped with the deployment here at Hansu? And you know, talking a bit about more about the DevOps, you know, and the CI/CD pipelines, the Bitbucket bundle, and all those, you know, uh, I guess standard uh, tools we're all used to. Yeah, I mean, is. There's lots of services which work really well together. So, you, and you can sort of mix and mix and match as you need them as well. So, um, internally, we've got a combination of the Elastin stack, um, which is you know your, your traditional sort of um, task management, feature management, release management. Um, but also, we couple that with tools like Azure uh, DevOps and GitHub as well to manage application development, um, network and service state management, and a lot of the automation. So we've. It depends on the use case, but it is very good um, to now to just not be stuck with one tool and mix and match um, with services that suit the organization. Um, so, I mean, getting your CI CD pipeline um, as a company set up and ready to automate to ensure quality and, you know, is, should be a key focus because they're just invaluable right. in the long run. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, I guess we, you know, as I said before, uh, it is, it seems like, you know, such a massive topic. There's always stuff to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, and by we can always dive into uh, some aspects uh, later on. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Would you like to add anything else while we're here? I don't, th I don't think so. I think it's just um, the, the sooner you, you jump into the services, the sooner you can get the benefits. But um... That's it's true. Very, it's very exciting. That's for sure. It is. It is. It does sound that way. Uh, thanks a lot for your time, Des. Cool. And looking forward to talking again. Excellent. Speak soon. Cheers. Cheers.